Why do we all love stories so much? When I was a kid, my mom used to read me stories before bed. And every night when she finished reading one or two stories, I would always request the same thing. Another story. One night, when I was four or five years old, she gave herself a challenge unbeknownst to me. She was going to keep reading me more stories until I had had enough. Until I stopped asking for more stories. She was determined to outlast me. And long story short, she failed. After she had read countless books to me, I still asked for more. Finally, she just told me to go to bed. I was a kid who loved stories. And today, my kids are the exact same way. There seems to be an innate desire in the human heart to hear and to tell great stories stories. Stories entertain us. They communicate ideas. They are powerful. They shape our identity. And we are hardwired to appreciate and to retell them. Now, the Christian view is that our love of stories has been given to us by our creator. It was God who designed us to value stories. It was he who wrote the story of the world, the story of God's good creation, of man's fall, of Christ's rescue, and of the future restoration of all things that all good stories truly point to. The best stories point to that story. One thing is undeniable. Stories matter. And there is a way of using stories to capture the imagination of people in order to share and even defend the Christian message. It's called imaginative apologetics, and we're going to do a deep dive on how you can use really great stories to help your kids understand the biblical view of the world. This is Worldview Legacy, the show that helps Christian men become the worldview leaders their families and churches need. My name is Joel Sedecase. I'm a Bible teacher and former pastor who used to defend the Christian worldview the completely wrong way until God changed my attitude and my approach. Now, I help people to share and defend their faith with confidence and to pass it on to the younger generation. Today, we're going to answer the question, how can stories help you defend your Christian faith and pass it on to the younger generation? There's going to be a lot of really practical application on how to use stories with your own kids. This is going to be hugely useful as you seek to lead your family in the Christian worldview. Today, you're going to hear from Dr. Michael Jahoski. This is Mike's third time on the show. He is a Tolkien scholar, and he writes on great authors like J.R.R. Tolkien, and C.S. Lewis, and he's going to help us understand the importance of capturing the imagination of our listeners as we're defending our Christian faith. And he's going to help us know how to do the exact same thing when we're seeking to teach our own children about the Christian worldview, and to do this through excellent stories. If you want to learn a new method for defending your faith effectively, or if you just want some solid recommendations of stories to read to your kids that won't corrupt their minds, this episode is for you. Questions that we'll answer today include, what is imaginative apologetics? How does imaginative apologetics actually work? Why do parents need good tools for teaching their kids the Christian worldview? What books by J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis should you be reading to your kids? What are the benefits of teaching your kids about the concept of mystery, not the genre, but the theological idea? And what are some other stories that can help your children grow in the Christian faith? Hey, if you like what you hear today, then you're going to want to know about our free community. It's called the Think Squad. This is where you can connect with over 600 other members who are on the same journey as you. Think Squad members share ideas, insights, interests, and get solid biblical answers to questions all completely free. The Think Squad is extremely based by God's grace. And I'll tell you more about the group and how to join at the end of the show. So now let's get into it 
with Dr. Michael Jahosky. Hi, my name is Professor Michael Jahosky. I teach humanities at St. Petersburg College. All right, we are here with our friend Michael Jahosky, and we're going to talk about how to use epic stories and literature to teach your kids the Christian worldview. And I want to get right to the good stuff. So, to begin, Mike, who would win in a fight, Gandalf or Tom Bombadil? Uh, yeah, I'd have to go Tom all the way. I mean, here's a guy who tossed the really? one ring into the air. Yeah, <laughs> it, it didn't affect him. He put it on his finger, he kind of looks through it. It's a trifle to him. So I, I think despite the incredible power of Gandalf, Tom seems to be, he has that edge. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, uh, someone you mentioned earlier before we started recording, I think right. would probably agree with you on that. C.R. Wiley, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. who uh, I know you've had on your show. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've had on mine. And uh, he wrote that book, In the, in the House, House of, of Tom Bombadil. Yes, excellent book. And a uh, really nice guy. Yeah, very much so. So, mm -hmm. Michael, you talk a lot about imaginative apologetics. Mm -hmm. Can we just start there? Because I know this is something that you sure. are very passionate about. What mm -hmm. is imaginative apologetics? Well, I mean, there, there are a number of excellent scholars who have been doing it longer than I've been alive who could give you their definitions. My definition is that it's a branch of cultural apologetics which I can explain in a second too, but it's a way of commending and defending the faith in and reaching, I would say, as an appeal to and through the imagination. So a way of defending and commending the Christian worldview that appeals to primarily the imagination. But as scholars like Holly Wardway and Michael Ward will tell you, the imagination never operates independent of reason, and mm -hmm. reason never operates independent of imagination. The imagination is such a critical part or faculty of the human mind that uh, they can't be separated. So when we say that we're primarily appealing to the imagination, what I mean by that is through metaphor, symbol, you might say parable, through mythic epic literature, and, and that um, concretizes those big abstract concepts and makes them experiential and almost like we can taste it, you know, so that we can close our eyes and we can picture it. And so the imagination is just such an important part of being able to visualize and entertain ideas that then reason have to, has to sift through. And mm. is this true or false? And so it's one that kind of focuses on what we're talking about today, about mythic literature and we could say art, the visual arts as well, and music, although in a different kind of sense. But yeah, that's what imaginative apologetics is. Okay, would you say that imaginative apologetics is compatible with different schools of apologetics? On our show, we talk a lot about presuppositionalism. That's right. Would you, is imaginative apologetics compatible with presupp? I would definitely say so, Joel. I'm not an expert on, on presuppositionalism. I know a little bit about it, so you could correct me on this, but I'm more of a classical apologist in the way I approach it. So Bill Craig today or C.S. Lewis in the 20th century. I don't think it's incompatible with any school except maybe fideism, you know, really just the one that I could think of that may have still proponents today, but I don't think it's very mainstream. One that just doesn't operate on real, seem, seems to operate on reason or even imagination at all. But other than that, yes, I think it's in, entirely compatible. Uh, and it, in saying that, it also doesn't contradict or invalidate the importance of rational or evidential evidentialist apologetics. And so, yes, the answer is yes, I think so. Okay. When you say fideism, we're talking yeah. about a belief in belief, basically. Right. It's belief and not really grounded in reason or... Mm -mm, no. Uh, Logic. Reality. It's just a blind faith that uh, is kind of a caricature that many secular opponents, you might say, use to characterize the Christian faith. And yeah, that's what I meant. So imagination is... It's interesting. It's linked to our reasoning. Mm -hmm. And this sounds like a perfect segue if we're going to talk about stories yeah. and yeah. and how they connect with our reasoning and our worldview. Mm -hmm. But in general, why do parents need good tools for teaching the Christian worldview to our kids? Why don't we just tell them what it is and say, mm. this is what we believe and just propositionally give it to them? Why do we need tools in the first place? Sure. And that's great. I want to address that. I, I can talk a little bit more about how imagination and reason work together a little later on when we get to the concrete yeah, examples. That. Yeah. So let's come back to that. But I'm glad you asked this question because let me encourage you as a friend and, and any Christian listening that, of course, we need to 
uh, to, to propositionally announce and teach ourselves and uh, you know brothers and sisters in the faith and our children. And sometimes the direct approach, the direct communication approach, I'll distinguish between indirect later, is needed, especially if we need reminders or for memorization. Uh, and so again, it, that's we're not throwing that out. And so systematic theology and having everything ordered is very important. But a case could be made that in being indirect, we're modeling Jesus himself, who really didn't very often speak in any other way other than that. Mm. And it does enfold and encapsulate propositional truth, logical, rational, propositional, straightforward, direct truth in an indirect vehicle. And so we're still giving it to him, but kind of in a pill. Maybe yeah. that's not the best image for it, but uh, like a delivery system of sorts. So. Let me start with that, and then I have four brief reasons. I like lists. I think it's good for, mm -hmm. for podcasts and lessons. Um, so totally. let me go through. Yeah, I think you'll appreciate this. And so why do we have to have these tools? We'll talk more about story and imagination later. Um, and, uh, and of course, this links into that, that very topic. So number okay. one, God through Scripture commands that we... And I want to focus especially on how dads and moms can teach their kids, but this goes for other examples too. God, through Scripture, commands that we teach, and I'll have examples here in a minute, that we do that. So that's, that's the first thing for the Christian. So God in Scripture commands it. So Jesus. God commands us to teach our kids. Absolutely. In fact, let me give Scripture examples after each point, and I won't be able to read them in full. But to hear what comes Even to some mind. references, yeah, that'd be good. Yeah, sure. Okay, good, good. Yeah, I'll do that rather than load them on the end. So Deuteronomy 4, 9 through 10, and of course with the Shema Yisrael in, in chapter 6, verses 5 through 9, about keeping it before us all day and on our doorposts and on our foreheads and mm. constantly inculcating and teaching and, and uh, encouraging our children in the ways of the Lord. Proverbs chapter 4, which is a great, um, like, ch like chapter 8 later, a great wisdom tract, and also father listen, fathers, um, I'm sorry, sons listen to your father's instructions. Sure. Those are great scriptures for that. Jesus tells us to know the times. That's a second reason. And so we have to communicate to our kids, but we don't do that in a vacuum. We do it in a context. <sighs> Two verses in particular come to mind for that. First Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32 where David is, uh, he compliments or kind of commends the men of Issachar that they knew what they knew what the times were like. They knew yeah. what was needed for Israel. I uh, love that. Actually, I have a in my prayer app. I have mm. a prayer point in there. May I be like the men of Issachar who yeah. knew the times, understood the times. Yeah, that's su such a good short fragment uh, of a verse in there. You got to read it carefully. You'll miss it. Um, and it's so important. But then we see it again, uh, and I'm glad to hear it, Joel, that in Luke chapter 12, verses 54 through 56, uh, where Jesus rails against the, the, the people of his time about, you can tell when it's going to rain, you can tell if it's hot, but you can't interpret me, you can't interpret the times, you don't know the times, uh, which would then imply we need to know the times. So. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so uh, that's point number two. Uh, point number three, and this goes directly to kids and parents, but Jesus' ministry uh, very explicitly did not exclude children. We have here Matthew chapter 18, verse 3. Be we have to become like paideia in Greek, like young, like young seven or uh, younger children, I think is what the Greek means. And then Matthew 19, verses 13 through 15. Yeah, that's right. And uh, there the disciples are trying to prevent the children from coming to Jesus. And he says, don't, uh, for, for theirs is the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. So clearly Jesus, uh, and he says elsewhere too, doesn't he, Joel, about uh, better for somebody to have a millstone tied around their neck if they mess with to cause one the of these little ones who believe in me to stumble. Absolutely, and that's right. Mm -hmm. so you have to help me with that passage, but that, that's another important one I would join to that. Yeah, I want to say that's in Mark, but continue, please. Yeah, thanks. I couldn't track it down. Um, so obviously th the third point is the importance of children. Fourthly and finally, Jesus, and this is a point I make throughout my book, Matthew 18, 6. Sorry oh, to interrupt 18, you. 18, 6. No, not at yes. all. That's uh, three and, verses after. Yeah. Okay. And then Mark yeah. 9, 42 as well. Mark 9, 42. Okay, great. Thank you. Lastly, I would say that Jesus himself, in being who he is, models what not only what we need to say, but how we need to say it. So Holly Ordway, I, I love it when she put this in her book, that the incarnation is a, as much a model for what we say in substance or content in our apologetics and our teaching, but also in how we say it. And that is supremely important. The incarnation itself 
is an example of indirect communication. What could be more paradoxical than the union of God and man? Right. It is God's way of hiding and seeking. God loves hide and seek. And so mm. Jesus himself, not only the, the person of Jesus Christ models it in and of himself, but the incarnation himself came speaking in parables as if to say, do as I do. This is the way to teach. This may be the best way to teach. Jesus says in Mark and elsewhere in the synoptics, uh, and I don't think in John's gospel because there aren't any parables to my knowledge. What does he say? He says, you know, to, to everything, I, I will speak in parables. And he spoke nothing to them except in parables. Right. And that's everywhere in the Gospels. So we need these tools. So this is something that God commands us to do, but it's also something that he uses himself. He uses these tools. Absolutely. And so that to me is very fascinating. The idea that God Almighty is using l tools of literature and, and tools of pedagogy and education, yeah. which it makes sense because all good teaching is ultimately going to emulate the teacher, the greatest teacher ever. <laughs> you know, One would think. God, yeah, it's the that's Lord. Right. That's so right. we're talking about tools to train your kids in the Christian worldview. Maybe we ought to just define our terms a little further. What sure. does it mean to teach the Christian worldview? How will we know when we've taught the Christian worldview? Hmm. There's a lot of different criteria for this, but I've been blessed by the work of many in structuring it in a narrative form. What is Christianity? I mean, you could go to Lewis or Tolkien, who, who Lewis and Tolkien, actually, who gave him the idea, who gave Lewis the idea, is, is the myth became fact. It's the really, yeah. really true story, but it, it is first and foremost, it's a narrative. So Christianity, scripture itself is a story. It has a beginning, it has a middle and an end. It has creation, it has fall, uh, temptation and fall. It has redemption, like every good story has, right? Yes. The conflict resolution, we might frame it. And then it has a has a tie up, it has a restoration, has a, an ending. So there's three or four parts of the story. We know, I think, also by looking at scripture, and I think scripture gives us the, that data, I would say that um, we know we're teaching the Christian worldview if what we teach also does not contradict what Scripture says. And so there we have to look at mm. inerrancy. And inerrancy, if I understand it correctly, is that in everything that Scripture teaches, it does not contradict itself. It does not teach anything false. Yeah. And so obviously this would be a, an important criteria for knowing that we're teaching the right stuff. To look at um, how Jesus himself modeled uh, what it means to be a Christian in, in in his own life and ministry and in the way he interpreted scripture, which we, in our previous conversation, remember we talked about the Emmaus Road in Luke 24, yeah. remember? And uh, looking back and, oh, foolish men of this generation, I mean, do you not know this all had to happen in order for the Messiah to, to get to this point, something along those lines? And then he took them through Moses and the prophets. And so I think these are some guiding or some guideposts or guardrails that tell us we're on the right track. So yeah. I love this because you and I, we approach worldview thinking differently. And I realized mm -hmm. this maybe in our first conversation when we were talking about Tolkien and Lord of the Rings. So I tend to think of the Christian worldview as answering seven major questions. Mm -hmm. Questions like, what is ultimately real? What is good? What does it mean to be human? What is our destiny? Where does everything come from? That sort of thing. Who is Jesus? Okay. I, yeah. I like that framework. I think it works. One of the things I appreciate about you, Mike, and the way that you think is you think of worldview in terms of the way you just described it as a narrative. Mm -hmm. It's a story. It's a story that you find yourself in. Mm -hmm. And if I could elaborate on this just a little bit. Yeah. I remember years ago I wrote, I read this book. I think it was called Suburbianity. Mm. It's about the suburbanization of the church. It talks about some social phenomena. But oh, okay, cool. In, in this book, he talks about this. He says, reading the Bible, and if your first question is you read the Bible is, how does this apply to my life? How, uh, it's like, how is this about me? Okay. Mm. That's the, think about what, what, what that's like. So mm. here's what that's like. God told Abraham, look out at the stars. Your offspring is going to be more numerous than the stars. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, the offspring of Abraham, there's his physical offspring the Hebrew people and even his offspring through Ishmael as well. There's mm -hmm. his physical offspring, but then mm -hmm. there's his offspring of the promise, which is everyone who shares his faith, who has mm -hmm. the faith in the Messiah. That's that right. is countless billions of people throughout history. Yeah. So you look out at the, the stars, you are one of those stars, if mm -hmm. you will. You've got a place in that 
skyscape. That's right. And so asking, how is all this about me, is like looking up at the night sky <laughs> and going, how is all that about me? Right. It's like, no, 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 no. no. That's not about you. But no. you do have a place That's in right. that scene. Yeah. You're one of those stars. You're in that galaxy. Brilliant. And I, I can't help but go there as you talk about worldview as a story and yeah. think, this is a grand story that encompasses everything and mm -hmm. we are in that we're situated in that That's and right. so what are some of the effects of yeah. thinking of ourselves as being in god's story and thinking of worldview in that way oh yeah let me first be quick to agree i have it somewhere here in my notes and in even in my own book where i've committed to this in writing that i completely agree that's the way that we should approach worldview. What this is, though, what scholars will say is it's a propositional, a rational, uh, that sounded like I said irrational, I meant to say rational, sorry, Got let it. me be clear. <laughs> a very rational propositional approach. That's not a wrong approach, a narrative is a right approach. That's a an excellent approach. This is also an excellent approach. What I mean to say is that narrative just indirectly answers those, addresses and answers those questions, five questions I've heard, origin, identity, meaning, morality, destiny. You sometimes need to be more specific and expand that. And I completely agree. Yes, those are the, those are the things that, that the Christian worldview addresses. And then let's come back to your question again. And I think it's an excellent question. I think this gets into a little bit of epistemology and philosophy and Lewis's essay, Myth Became Fact, about what human experience is like. Yes, human thinking is incurably abstract, uh, like mathematics, he says, as an example mm -hmm. of this. But everything we experience is experiential. It's concrete. And as we're experiencing this pain, this pleasure, this man, he says, we're not thinking about capital P, pain, pleasure, or, or person. We're just, we're in the midst of it. And so I think when we think along these lines, this also goes to his meditation in a tool shed one of my favorite epistemological essays of Lewis, where there's a difference between looking at and looking along. And while imagination and reason are both involved in each of those perspectives. All right. And so just for those who aren't familiar with the meditations in a sure. tool shed, can you just give us oh, the 30 yeah. second synopsis of that meditation? So yeah, looking at is like he says, a neuroscientist looking at how thinking happens in the brain. It's, it's a very rational, propositional, scientific. Okay. We're looking at something, we're analyzing it, we're studying it. When we so look like at the, the light particles. Yes, okay, okay, yeah. looking at the looking light particles. The... You're, you're inside of a tool shed, there's a hole right. in the tool shed and a beam of light is coming in, That's and right. you're looking at the light. That's you're exactly not... right. Yeah, okay, got it, okay. And right. then you're not participating the second... in the light. Got yeah, it. it's very good. So looking along is kind of stepping into the light and looking along it to see, he says, the trees outside and then along billions of stars or however he puts it out, out in the universe. He has some poetic way of putting it. Um, what being part of the story and thinking in terms of story, why that's so valuable and what it changes is it really challenges us to look along the beam of light and to immerse ourselves and feel invited into, like you were saying with the wonderful example from uh, Abraham's story, to be part of the, you know, God's story. And we feel that we've been caught up in an ongoing drama. And that's how everyday life is. When we sit back and reflect, and this is what Lewis meant in that fir first essay, Myth Became Fact, when we reflect on our experience, we're pulling back and looking at it. But when we're oh, in it, right? Okay, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, so now we're, we're stepping into. So how does this address your question? Well, when we step into and respond to the parables, when we respond to Scripture as story, we are imaginatively and actually participating in the drama. And we start to, I joked in one interview I recently did about, you know, going to Target now takes on epic proportions, right? I'm going forth on a quest to <laughs> slay the dragon or to, uh, to acquire the treasure, which is nighttime diapers or something. That sounds exciting. Yeah, no, well, it is. Totally. And I'm not, not knocking it, but sometimes it may just kind of change the way we look at life and we really start to pull back and think wow life really is a story this is how i live it every day and so i think it really just is it's a paradigm shift when we look along the beam that's okay. what happens and so that's what happens when we look at christianity in that way so the christian worldview itself is a story yes but what i'm really curious to ask you about is what is the other than just reading the bible what yeah. is the benefit in bringing in other stories to help teach the mm -hmm. story that's taught by the Bible. What's the value yeah. of stories as a worldview teaching tool for our kids? Well, I, I would start first again with scripture and that scripture itself and that Christ himself um, really confirms that 
the Bible is our touchstone for truth. It must always be our ultimate standard. Christ said that it testifies about him. But it doesn't say that it's the monopoly on truth. You know, God has scattered types of himself and fragments of himself in a million places, and, and that we, uh, we find it focused in the Bible. It must always be our touchstone. But you think of Christ speaking, I think, in John chapter 9 to the Greeks. It may not be chapter 9 or chapter 12. It's, uh, it's in there somewhere. And... Uh, uh, you think of Paul on uh, Mars Hill in the Areopagus in Acts 17. I know that one. Mm -hmm. um, and you even think of the Magi story. That the other cultures have a share, not a complete revelation, but they have a share uh, or a fragmentary glimpse of the com total and complete truth that is in Christ and Scripture, where everything's coming to focus. And so Jesus and Scripture seem to say, well, you're not going to get the full revelation. You're not going to get the complete truth looking elsewhere. But there is value. There is truth, goodness, and beauty to f be found in other stories. Now, of course, when you think of Lewis and Tolkien, we know that they were Christian men of faith and that um, we go back and listen to our previous talks about whether it was intentionally and what that means. But to keep it simple, they wrote Christian stories. That much yeah. is true. How they did it is another question, but that's an easy sell because these are men who, whose minds were soaked with Scripture. And so we should be able to trust that this is going to be an easy way to say that it's not going to contradict Scripture. But I, I would just say that, too, that there's value in and just going even back to Genesis 1, that and you look at Scripture as a story, and it seems that one thing God constantly is, is He's a storyteller. He loves to play hide-and-seek. He, he seems to have given all of his imagers, and which we all are, Genesis 1, 26 and 7, the ability to make and create stories to reach out to him. Now, he had to disclose the full story to, to complete our gropings, but um, we, we love to tell stories. And so God seems to be inviting us to do that and that there's value in being his imagers that we are, like him, storytellers. And so he's almost encouraging that. Now, it can go very wrong, and we've seen it go wrong. Yeah, and the, sure. <laughs> let's well, and, make sure we point that out. Yeah, yeah, and even guys whose minds are saturated with Scripture, they're still fallen humans. So Absolutely. we still have to test everything against Scripture. Absolutely. Would you agree? I would. Nobody, nobody except Christ is perfect. That's right. That's yeah. right. So, yeah, so always a good rule of thumb. Okay, so here's one thing that I did want to ask you. Yeah. What is the story of how you learned the value of stories in mm. teaching the Christian worldview. So I tell this in the preface of my book, and I'll just give the very short, short version, but let me start there. In 2001, um, I had just turned 16, and I'm dating myself here, and, uh, and I, my, my mom had just recently returned to the faith, and uh, she kind of was attracting me to it, and I was looking over her shoulder, eating cereal in the morning, figuring out what is she listening to, what is she reading. We had, I'd grown up nominally Catholic, and then it's not really when I discovered this, but shortly thereafter, my brother Chris started reading me The Lord of the Rings, then the first movie came out, and I think looking back, I realized that was the moment when it started to, as an answer to your question, when the importance of stories and teaching through stories and understanding scripture through story and as a story started to take root, but it wasn't until after years and years of high school, undergrad, graduate school, becoming an adjunct, then becoming a full-time professor, and still professionally development, and all these years of wrestling with what it means to be a Christian, I still am wrestling with it, where I started, it started to gradually dawn on me, because when I first started to study apologetics, probably around 2010, formally, I was hitting all the very propositional, rational side of things. Mm -hmm. And I think I burned out on that. And I've read about a couple of other authors like Brian Gadawa is one who writes a lot of the Divine Council worldview, all that Mike Kaiser stuff, but sure. he's known for other things too. In his personal story, if I remember, he, he had a similar experience and that resonated with me. And I don't know exactly when it was, but sometime between 2010 and just a few years ago, maybe like 2017 or somewhere around there, I, I don't know for sure, Joel, but it just started to dawn on me that there was something I was missing. I wasn't nourishing my imagination, and therefore I was also neglecting my heart and my emotions, and I wasn't balanced, and I felt out of whack, and I felt I, I knew my stuff. I knew the doctrines. I knew this. I could have a good argument with people, but something just I felt like I had blown a fuse inside. Hmm. And so that's what was the catalyst to start digging into cultural and imaginative apologetics, for example. That's, man, that's really interesting. How, how cool of Thanks. God to use your burnout to, yeah. to bring you to this point where now this is such a huge part of what you teach and do. Yep. And yep. something Amen. occurred to me mm -hmm. that I wanted to ask you about. And that, okay, so that is, it seems to me like the non-Christian world 
also understands the importance of story and teaching, not mm-hmm. just telling a good story, but in teaching ideas. Oh, can yeah. you, I don't know, I'm putting you on the spot here, Mike, but yeah. can you think of any examples from culture where they're mm-hmm. using stories in order to communicate ideas that aren't biblical, that aren't true? Oof. Oh, yeah. Uh, sure. I have specific examples. Yeah. We, we both know as parents too, there's a lot of them. First, let me say, of course, going back to being God's imagers, part of what that means, aside from it being a status that, you know, is a ground for human rights and among a number of other very important things, mm-hmm. I believe that scripture, the rest of scripture reveals that God is a storyteller and that if he's a storyteller, we're storytellers. And so obviously mm-hmm. the natural logical you know, inference here would be that it follows that everyone is going to be prone to telling stories. Alistair E. McGrath in his book, Narrative Apologetics, talks about this. And he cites a lot of sociological research and anthropological research. The book is called Narrative Apologetics, and he's got a big footnote on it very early in his book. Like, look at all these authors who have done research about addressing your question. Where can we see other people outside of the church being drawn to stories as a method for teaching? Okay, so there's that. But then there's specific examples of, can I think of one? I mean, sure, with what's going on with Disney recently, I mean, my wife and I, totally. oh yeah, we could go down a rabbit hole, but let me give you one yeah. specific example with the, I don't even know the real title of the movie, the Red Panda one. Um, oh yeah. What, what's it called? Seeing, it, g- turning red. Turn that's red. it. Seeing or yeah. turning red. Well, yeah, that's it. So yeah. you've got the big, the hands on the cheeks. It's uh-huh. a cute thing. And I, like with, with a, a lot of things in culture, there is a mixed bag and you know, the mama bear apologists out there uh, who do their ministry talk about chewing and spitting, and right. uh, and yes, there's value in that, but that doesn't Taking mean the that good, we should get rid of the bad. Mm. Exactly, we shouldn't. Though, if we know that a, a movie, for example, is smuggling in propaganda, especially anti-Christian mm-hmm. propaganda, not biblical messages, you shouldn't say, "Oh, well, let's have the kids watch it," you know, as an experiment of chewing and spitting. I wouldn't. And even worse examples, I wouldn't expose them to certain things that have those uh, agendas explicitly because they can learn it through better sources. So I'm not a proponent. They don't need to watch all the seasons of Game of Thrones in order no. to learn how to no. discern. Yeah. Oh, goodness, no. No, absolutely yeah. not. That's exactly what I mean. Yeah. But uh, we still need to teach them to be discerning, of course. But That's good. That's yeah, good. I, I would say that that's a specific example. And there are subtle images about being a young girl and letting feelings dictate truth. And right. as we watched it, and then Annabelle, our youngest, uh, our five-year-old daughter, started to, we joked, we kind of acting like it. And we, we didn't know. We didn't do enough research before we watched it. And uh, we mm-hmm. found out the, the hard way. It kind of affected another example, too, is she got into, and we didn't realize this. Again, we, we learned. We should have known better. The Descendants movie, which is another Disney thing. Oh, okay. Uh, you know about that one? I've, vaguely. Yeah. Not, not too uh, much, but yeah, tell me. So the, so the premise is that these are kids of the Disney villains, like Corella DeVille right. and all those. Okay, so there's some young men and women who are the kids that uh, they're really bad, and the music is catchy and great, but that's just a perfect example of how vehicle can smuggle in for good or for bad, for better or for worse, the right or the wrong kinds of message. And it's very powerful. That vehicle is extremely powerful because if my daughter who loves music and dance, she's not going to think about the message if she's in the midst of doing the music and the dance. As she's tasting, she's not thinking like Lewis says. And so we, we've, we've got tons of examples. Yeah. yeah. You know, that is such a good example because you know the movie Thanks. Encanto. Yes. Okay. That's another one. Yeah. Great example. So that song yeah. that mm. has been in everyone's head for the last year. We don't talk about Bruno. In fact, I just said that, and ninety percent of the dads are going. Don't even mention it. Don't mention it. No. We all just got out of got it out of our heads. Yes. My kids, our my four year old, uh-huh. can sing you the words, and yeah. there's like rapping parts in it. Uh-huh. But my kids know that. Now compare how well they know that. And I'm not saying that's a bad song. I, I don't think it's a particularly bad song, no. but it just goes to show you, okay, so it's tied to a story, it's right. musical, it's imaginative, it's yep. really catchy, really well done. Now, compare that to how much work we have to put in in the mornings to get them to memorize their Bible verses, which exactly. we're doing in the mornings. And yeah. it's like, man, I wish I could write music like Lin-Manuel <laughs> Miranda or I tell know, right? stories like Pixar <laughs> because the kids, they do, you're right, they learn yeah. that stuff and they they're, do. what did you say? They're Well, they're tasting, they're not thinking. 
Right. That's what Lewis says in Myth Became Fact is that we're, yeah. as we're experiencing pain or experiencing pleasure, we're not thinking about, uh, we're not thinking about what it is. We're not mm -hmm. being critical thinkers. I think Jeff Myers in one of his books, Understanding the Times, he points out about, you know, how the word entertainment, I think, has Latin roots about to hold in the mind. But today, it, it doesn't mean that. It means to shut off your brain and uh, to turn it off and to turn off critical thinking. And I'm afraid that's kind of the default position of what happens. Right. Uh, and so we, we have to do better. And so we teach our kids. And if we encounter things, if we forget to look at something and they encounter something on media, we talk them through it. Yeah. There's another great ex funny example, the Zootopia movie. You've probably seen that one. Oh, sure. And, there's a, and it's got uh, several good parts, but there's that uh, Shakira song. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, my daughter goes crazy over it. My son likes it, but it's try everything. You know that one. Yeah, and, I want to uh, try everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but my son, because we taught him, he always says try every good thing, and he just oh. every time it comes on, he's like, oh no, that's not right. And I'm like, that's right, buddy. And I, I've I've told that's him good. too, like when he's around his friends, I'm like, buddy, you, you know it, so you don't have to say it every time. But encourage your friends, yes, to think that, but. You don't have to say that every time the song comes on. He's just so funny. <laughs> right. He feels like he has to put it in there. Uh, yeah. Good so. for him, man. That's awesome. Okay, so you're a, a Tolkien scholar. Can you give us an example of a Tolkien story, or how do we use yeah. Tolkien to teach the biblical worldview? Oh, sure. Let me tell you a story, as a matter of fact, to illustrate Please. the point. So I can't remember when it exactly was, but earlier this year, you know, we had uh, C.R. Wiley on the, on the show, and... I had read in the house of Tom Bombadil and we were just with my kids. We started at the beginning of the year reading the Lord of the Rings and I'm like, I'm going to give this a shot. We read the Hobbit. They loved it. Um, want to see how this, you know, I know it's a bit of a slow burn in the beginning and we were just right before, uh, just after I finished the interview, we were just about to get to chapter seven of book one in the fellowship of the ring, which is in the house of Tom Bombadil. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, Oh, this is going to be great. And I've got sublimated all of this stuff I learned from Wiley's book. And I was so eager to share it with the kids, but I, I, I didn't want to narrate. I didn't want to get in there and insert my propositional. Oh, there's the tree and the tomb and don't you see it? And I wanted to just go crazy, but I didn't. And I just read the story. I did the voices. I, I read it to him and I got to tell you, Joel, they were so enchanted as they were listening. And my daughter just yesterday, I asked her, I said, what was your favorite part of Lord of the Rings so far? We're in the council of Elrond now. Hmm. And she said, Oh, I love Tom Bombadil's house. There's food, there's Goldenberry, even though it's Goldberry, she calls right. her Goldenberry. Goldenberry. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. I love it. Like, and Tom Bombadil. And I'm like, no, no, it's Bombadil. Oh, you know what? Just, that's so cute. Just say it the way you Bomba want Bill, to. Bombadil. Go with but it. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, honey. And, and I'm like, so tell me why that's your favorite. She's going on about the food and they're singing and there's hot baths and there's Goldenberry. And I'm like, wow, images, right? The kids have fixated on this, and these are such good images for Christ and the kingdom. And so I want to use that as an example, and I want to give you kind of like a theme about what in the house of Tom Bombadil, that chapter, and just Tom and Goldberry uh, themselves, and that whole part of the story can teach us and uh, teach our kids. Cool. Now, once we finished the story, we got to the fog on the Barrow Downs, and they got attacked by the Barrowites, which is not in the movies, which is the next chapter, mm -hmm. and they loved it. And backing up, though, back in the, ch the chapter in the House of Tom Bombadil, as I was reading, I could not only just see them, the gears were turning, but there was an early part in the chapter where Frodo asks Goldberry, I think, first, who, who, is, who is he? You know, a lady? Who is Tom? And I think she says at first, well, he is. And I'm like, oh, that's peculiar. As I read it, I'm like, oh, Lucas is going to, his eyebrow is going to go up. And lo and behold, he did. He's like, huh. And I could see this quizzical look on his face. But this, he was contemplating. And as I kept reading, there's another part where Frodo asks Tom directly uh, or Goldberry again. And at one point, I think Tom no, later says, literally, I am. Or I am almost like what Christ said. I am he, right? And at that moment, I can't remember the sequence of the chapter. Lucas was like, hey. That's like, that's like the Moses. That's like God. And he just started spitting out stuff. And I'm like, wow, he gets it. Wow. And I was just so impressed because we've been catechizing our kids. And, and as I told you, we use as one of the sources, your catechids book and teaching them about scripture and the story. And so he had already known about this, obviously. So that was just an exciting moment for me and Sarah as parents. But what I learned myself about this story and how, what can we use this story to teach our kids and no, for the people listening, I'm not suggesting that we should just look at Tolkien as a, a machine that we should spit out biblical lessons. That's not how I approach it in my book. Right. But there is something that can be learned, and there are many things that can be learned. What can be learned? I think here is a great way to introduce your kids to mystery. Mm. 
Now, cool. a lot of people outside the church caricaturize mystery as uh, something that, gee, we can't figure out, so we'll just slap the term mystery on it. Yeah. That's not what mystery is. Uh, you go to the Greek, and it's something that is hidden but yet to be disclosed. It's not something that can always be fathomed comprehensively by human reason. And if the assumption isn't that human reason is the be-all, end-all, then that is a humbling thought, and it's an encouraging thought. Yeah. And so mystery is something that it clearly can't be fully comprehended by reason. It's not irrational. That's what we always think of as mystery. It's non-rational. And that's a totally different way of putting it, I think, to yeah. our opponents, too. Uh, people who would take issue with this, this understanding. It's not irrational. It's non-rational. Tom is a mystery. And so it's, it was a great opportunity for us to teach our kids about the doctrines of the faith and how Christ is a mystery. That doesn't mean we don't know who he is, but look at how he talked about who he is. He didn't do it directly. He spoke mm -hmm. in parables. And Tolkien seems to be kind of weaving his own spell here through parable. And so it was an opportunity to teach our kids the right understanding of mystery and to like, well, what specific examples, what images popped out to you that that made you kind of scratch your head or I forget how I put it, it was something like that. Hmm. And they went for it as, as great as any eight and five year old can, better than, than right. I was at eight or five, let me tell you. Sure. So that's, that's my first example. That's great. Okay, so yeah. you're talking about mystery. I'm thinking, man, there's plenty of mysteries about the Lord that I don't have figured out. The Trinity comes to mind. Oh, yeah. How God is one and God is three. Yep. Okay, so that's very cool. And now, how about Lewis? How about C.S. Lewis? Oh, yeah. There's so many great opportunities. So I picked one from each. And the one that I just gravitated again because I wanted to give you concrete examples from my mm -hmm. own life as a dad. Um, and I thought, well, what did we finish reading? We just started The Silver Chair. Years ago when we started reading the Narniad, we didn't read it in the, the right order, the order of publication, I think it is, where you start with Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe. We did it in chronological order. I think you know, my son is mature enough. He understands that we're going to restart it in a, in a, you know, when we finish it from the right way to see how it's different. Okay. Um, people put a lot of faith in how you read the, the Narniad. But just Sorry, real recently, quick, let me interrupt you. Sure. When you say the Narniad, you're talking about the Chronicles of Narnia. The, that's the body that's right. Of, the, the body of, which I love that name for it, but yeah. I don't know if our, our listener had heard that Thank before, you so. for, yes. yes, sorry about no the problem. jargon. Yes, that's very important. Okay. So the Narniad is one of the abbreviations that scholars use for the seven books called the Chronicles of Narnia okay. by C.S. Lewis, uh, you're written in the 1940s and 50s, that's right. Okay, uh, so... So please continue. Yeah, no, no, no problem. So the family and I just recently finished The Voyage of the Don Shredder. And I, I just mentioned that little preface because people were like, oh, well, what, they might be wondering, you know, what order did you read the books in? And I know some of my friends might be listening who will jump on me. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah, there's some sticklers for sure. <laughs> okay. Oh, uh -huh. yeah, I know a few. And I love them. So anyway, Voyage of the Don Shredder has, like uh, in the book before it, Prince Caspian, a great character, Reepicheep the Mouse. And he's a warrior ma mouse. He's a, he's a knight. And uh, some of us might know him even from the, the motion picture films and, and love the way that he was embodied and incarnated in the film. I think it was hit or miss, but it, pretty decent. And the, the thing that really just came to me is my kids just loved the, the whole idea of a talking mouse and they loved how serious he was and he was loyal and he was brave and he was devoted. And in The Voyage of the Don Treader, you know, there's that uh, that rhyme, for those of you that don't know, towards the beginning of the book, when the kids enter Narnia again, um, they're on the boat, and we find out that, that Reepicheep is looking for Aslan's country. And just hearing that, my kids kind of perked up, like, oh, what's Aslan's country? And I imagine images started going through their mind, and I'm like, oh, this is going to be good. And so Reepicheep shares that a dryad woman had uh, said this verse over his cradle as a, as a baby mouse that, um, what is it? Where sky and water meet, where the waves grow sweet, doubt not, reap a cheap to find all you seek. There is the utter east. And he says, I do not know what it means, but the spell of it has been on me all my life. And the story picks up speed again right after that poignant moment. But I just remember seeing my kids so immersed in that and seeing the uh, evolution from those two books, Prince Caspian and Voyage, of reap a cheap. He is an archetypal example of a Christian disciple. That's... Hmm. I think he is, and other scholars have picked up on this. How so? Well, the virtues that he displays, his uh, devotion to Aslan, 
is very admirable, right? He, um, he's, he seems to be a, a rational, loyal mouse, but he's also, he's a swashbuckler. He is, he's a fun, loving mouse at the same time. So he seems to mm. have this very holistic feel of a disciple who grasps the importance of image and proposition. This idea that he's a thinker, but he's also a fighter. He's a warrior, but he's a scholar. Um, he grows as a mouse throughout the two books. Um, in various ways, we can see just his utter devotion to Aslan and finding Aslan's country alone can be cited as an example of the, that makes the sense hunger. To yeah, the that hunger sense. for for paradise, for to be with Christ. Yeah, image, image, and proposition. I'm not, I'm not seeing that. Can you flesh that out for me? Yeah. How does Reepy Cheap understand both image and propos- proposition? So he knows who Aslan is. He knows he's the son of the emperor across the sea. Propositionally, he knows the doctrine, right? He knows the facts, but he also embraces the uh, the imminent arrival at Aslan's country, which he's picturing. He's got a, a vivid imagination. He obviously repeating this verse. We get little um, foretastes of what Aslan's country is going to be like, and lo and behold, at the end of the book, the water is sweet, uh, mm-hmm. quite literally. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's this giant wave, and there are these towering mountains. And, and so maybe it's a bit of a stretch, but I see in him and his character arc the life of a full-orbed Christian disciple who understands the importance of uh, imagination and reason, is what I more so meant by that. That that actually makes a lot of sense. Thanks okay. for explaining that. that Good. Man, that's fascinating. Okay. Thanks. Cool. So Tom Bombadil yeah. introduces kids to mystery. Yes. Reepy Cheap introduces kids to a picture of a full-orbed discipleship, an expectant hope, but a willingness to learn and fight and grow yes. here in this world until we get to Aslan's country, if you That's will, right. or heaven. Wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> very, very cool. Man, this is good. Mike, yeah, I good. knew you would not disappoint when it came no. to uh, Tolkien and Lewis. Thank very you. cool. Thank, Thank you. you. Now, let me, let me put your feet to the fire a little bit here. Can you sure. give us an example of a story that could be useful in teaching the biblical worldview, one that our listener maybe is not as familiar with. Yeah. Um, so for my own personal, I have tons, and I know this might be getting back into our previous interview, and I don't want to, to go there. I want to stick with Christian literature, but I would cool. say a case could be made, too, for um, you know, literature that isn't explicitly Christian but that isn't antithetically Christian. At the same time, if I've worded that okay, don't go necessarily and read Philip Pullman's, what is it, the Golden Compass series, but which oh, yeah. is very antithetical to the Christian faith. It's like an anti-Narnia right. book. That's uh, what I, Yeah, it's like the yeah. atheist Narnia books, Yeah, that's right? what... Kind of? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, okay. okay. I, I think I tried years ago to start reading the first book, and I just lost interest because the worldview just uh, just doesn't, doesn't correspond. So Is that the guy who did... His dark materials. To that's the that's the name of the series, I think. Yeah, that's what I thought. That's, that's what I thought. I was yeah. talking with somebody about that recently. Yeah, okay. I'd like and to take a second look, but yeah, is um I've never read it because of the mm. same thing that you just said. I'm like, yeah. I don't want to waste my time. Yeah. But uh, what about the house with a clock in its walls? Is that part I, of that as well, or is that separate? No, it's separate. But I, I saw that it was made into a movie, and a lot of kids have made a big fuss about it. I mean, I've heard about it through the grapevine. Uh, I don't know much okay. about it. Okay, um, I don't either. I've heard it's in the same sort of uh, category. Yeah, okay. same vein of, of being sort of an atheistic uh, oh. fantasy type. Oh. Anyway, I don't want to get distracted. So no. On. Okay. Well, so the only reason I mentioned that... So you're recommending that all of our dads go out and basically read devilish uh, atheist books. Got it, Mike. Okay. Is that, what, is that what I said? Wait, something <laughs> broke up. I think my, my mic's not working here. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. Go on. Testing. Go on. No, no. I'm kidding. So... Um, uh, what I what I would say maybe in, separately is that there there is a case to be made. I have more examples that I could give, but if I restricted myself to something okay. that you may not have heard of, that is, I, I think actually, uh, I don't know too much about Stephen Lawhead, but from what I do know, and I'm still doing my research, the author's name is Stephen Lawhead. Um, he's written a, a tons of different series, but I, I believe he is a Christian. I don't know his theological background, but definitely from reading a book and a half of a five, at least five book series so far, I'm in the midst of reading it, and the little research that I've done on it outside of reading it so far has shown me that this Pendragon cycle, which um, many of you may or may not have heard of, um, is a really good recommendation where we can teach our, probably our older kids, about religious pluralism and uh, why it's not a good, or metaphysical pluralism if you like, it's not a good idea why we can bring in Lewis's argument for myth and the stuff that we've talked about before and how there's a better way of looking at it. 
that still maintains Christian teaching. But what, I, what I'm trying to say here is that this is a book where we see a clash of worldviews and universes. We have pagan Atlantis. Uh, it's a very interesting story. The first book, Taliesine, which is based off of a, uh, the name of a real or quasi-real uh, mytho-historical bard, um, is huh. about the fall of Atlantis and pagan Britain and how those two come together. But also in that time where Rome left and the Anglo-Saxons are coming in and Britain is becoming slowly you know, Angleland, right, after the Anglo-Saxons mm -hmm. and Christianity is coming back. And so we have pagan Britain, the dying out of the old ways. We have Atlantis. We have Christianity. How does Christianity measure up in the world out there with all these different worldviews? And, and, and even because it's kind of historical fiction, um, with obviously heavy on the fiction with Atlantis and such, but where, how do these competing views and narratives get along? Well, let, let me stop you right there because sure. are you saying that Stephen Lawhead in his book actually gets into these things? Like, oh, yeah. Christ oh, yeah. Christianity is a specific, explicit part of the story? Let me, yeah, let me elaborate just a little bit more because it's okay. very fascinating. So this first book, Taliesine, um, T-A-L-I-E-S-I-N, Taliesine. The second okay. book is called Merlin. The third book is called Arthur. Hmm. Fourth book is Pendragon. And the fifth book is called Grail, I think. Okay, yeah, because yeah. Pendragon is another name for King Arthur. Yes, He's it's like Pendragon, a title. That's right. And I think Uther. So, you know, there's different variations of the myth of Arthur mm -hmm. and Merlin. That sounds fascinating. What, it what, is. What would, be, is. what would be one of the insights um, directly relevant to, like, the biblical worldview? Oh, sure. Um, that, that you've picked up or mm -hmm. that you think, you know, our listener could pick up? Really big uh, overt references to creation, fall, redemption, restoration. I mean, the, just the whole first really? part of the book... Oh, yeah, is about the fall of Atlantis. And so here's another detail. Again, I don't want to spoil too much, but Charis, mm -hmm. the daughter of Atlantis, you see the fall of Atlantis. You see kind of the creation, fall, redemption, restoration of just that, that island continent. And then the refugees coming to Britain and the idea of themes of rebirth uh, and resurrection cool. even and marriage. And so there's lots of biblical themes going on. I mean, anybody who's got a discerning eye from Scripture and ear will be able to pick up on this. Mm -hmm. And just the way that... Uh, and then about religious pluralism and, and what even scripture says about the disinherited nations and the relationship between Israel and all the other fallen nations and, and how God intermediates between them. You can see that in the very story of Atlantis and Britain and Christianity and paganism. And I think it offers for older kids in particular, including mm -hmm. us big kids, really great ripe examples from fiction about how to engage this question. Is Christianity the only completely true religion and what makes it so and how can we argue that and what does that mean for the other ones are they all devilish and evil and wasteful i mean what does it mean you know yeah it sounds like it really does connect up to some big ideas it does so what is one next step that a dad can take to begin integrating stories even some of the stories that you've yeah. mentioned here today into the discipleship and worldview training of his kids? Well, I would first recommend that you just do it. Um, just like hmm. Proverbs tells us, get wisdom, get insight. Just just get it, man. Just start reading to your kids if you're not reading them good Christian right literature or literature that isn't hatefully, destructively anti-Christian. I would be very cautious and discerning. Make sure you measure it up to Scripture and, and to what Christ is and, and who he is. Um, that would be my first piece of advice. It's just there's just so many dads that I hear uh, and, and that I observe just don't seem to read to their kids, and I know some that do. And uh, I'm, I'm blessed to know a couple nearby that uh, really always sharing articles about this. So it seems to be the general piece of advice first is just make sure you're reading to your kids, and the more you do it, the more you're going to want to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of like prayer, you know. Is that sometimes it feels like a duty. Um, and you know, David in the Psalms, it's a duty to delight. Sometimes we have to go through that what feels like drudgery to realize that this is good for us. And I get it. If you're exhausted, you're a dad, you're working hard for your family, uh, moms too, but specifically for fathers that it's really important. And I think mom enjoys listening to because my wife loves it. So that's really important. But then more specifically, I would say dads, um, train yourself up. And I would recommend one terrific book that's very readable. It's not too, um, it's really not going to be over anybody's head. It's not very technical. It's a beautiful read, and it gives you tons of specific 
uh, tips, like especially for your older kids who start to maybe, hopefully, I pray that this never happens, but if they start to get cynical or over, overly skeptical and they maybe even walk away from church and the faith, um, this is a great book for this. And it can also train you. It's called the, uh, I'm sorry, let me back up, Hide and Seek, The Sacred Art of indirect communication. And indirect communication is, is myth, it's, it's narrative, it's uh, metaphorical, it's poetry. And it's such a great book. Again, it's called Hide and Seek, The Sacred Art of Indirect Communication by Benson Fraser. And that's just such an important book to read for you. That's, that's my second sort of uh, piece of advice. Get educated about why this is good for you and your kids. And, and also, well, how do I do it? I'm not a good storyteller. And I'll admit, I'm not the best, you know, off the cuff all the time, but I've learned to try to be, and I'm still trying to be, because it's hard. It's, it's not easy yeah. to weave a good yarn. My father-in-law is great at this. Yeah. Um, he's just such a gifted, natural storyteller, and uh, really? it's like, all right, Mike, you go. And it's like, oh, yeah, nope. <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, yeah, I got I to gotta keep, keep honing those skills. So even I need that help. Um, that, okay. Yeah, that's a good start. All right. Um, well, yeah. that's good. A that, couple of really practical things there. And yeah. uh, speaking of practical things that people can do, I'd like to give a plug to our listener for your website, which is mythicmission.com. You can go to mythicmission.com, mm-hmm. and that'll connect you up with all of Michael's um, resources. He's got his book on there, The Good News of the Return of the King. There's book reviews on there. You can directly connect with his podcast. But uh, rather than overwhelm everybody, I think, yeah, just go to the website and and engage. There's tons of really good stuff on there. And there's even a way they can support you through Patreon, too, th- mm-hmm. that way, correct? If you want to support our ministry, um, even right now we're running a, uh, a free class on imaginative apologetics for folks that there's yeah. information about that. So, but, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, we'll do stuff like this from time to time, and um, that's how we're doing our ministry, through the podcast, through classes, through you know, meet and greets on Facebook. Um, if you if you subscribe to Patreon, you'll get an invitation uh, automatically to that group. And so yada, yada. The website has it all. Yeah. Fantastic. All right. Well, you heard it. Go check out mythicmission.com. Connect up with Michael Jahoski's work and um, enjoy. And you'll get a lot from it. All right, sir. Well, thank you again. Always so appreciate likewise. appreciate your work. Appreciate you coming on, man. Thank you again. It was a pleasure to be on. Thank you. So now you know. Imaginative apologetics is a method of defending the Christian faith by appealing to the imagination through myth and parable. In other words, stories as a way of making important ideas concrete and giving the person an experience of the idea, letting them taste it. Why is it important? Because as Michael pointed out, the imagination never operates independently of our reasoning and vice versa. Why do we need to use good tools in discipling our kids? Because God commands it, because the times call for it, and because Jesus modeled it for us. We can use books like The Hobbit, and the Chronicles of Narnia books to capture our children's imagination and to help them develop good mental pictures of Christ and his kingdom. Teaching your children the benefit of mystery can help them comprehend the incomprehensible, and these stories can help you do that. Michael explained how Tom Bombadil, that mysterious character from The Lord of the Rings, can really help with this. As we uh, talked, we also talked about some other great books like Stephen Lawhead's Pendragon Cycle Stories. Dr. Michael Jahoski has a ton to say about stories and epic narratives and why they matter, how to understand them. If you want more excellent stuff from Michael, please go to mythicmission.com. Okay, now let me tell you about our community. If you have the desire to build a worldview legacy for your family, then join the Think Squad group now. This is the time to become the worldview leader that your family and church need. Get connected to others who are on the same journey as you and get access to the resources that we share and stuff to help you pass on your faith. Join the Think Squad group. All you have to do is open up Facebook and search for Think Squad, T H I N K S Q U A D. Answer the short membership questions, and that's all it takes. 
Thanks for listening to Worldview Legacy. This episode was produced by yours truly, Joel Sedecase, that's me, and is a production of the Think Institute. We equip believers to explain, share, and defend the Christian message.